Welcome to the Money Hour with host Tina Mitchell and co-host Keelan Harvey. Tina Mitchell, MLO 145420, and Keelan Harvey, MLO 1330075, are licensed loan originators with Highlands Residential Mortgage Limited, NMLS 134871. The views expressed by the speakers on the following program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of Highlands Residential Mortgage Limited, nor are they necessarily endorsed by Highlands Residential Mortgage Limited. Now, in the studio, local mortgage experts, Tina Mitchell and Keelan Harvey. Well, welcome to The Money Hour on 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, February 29th show. I am your host, Tina Mitchell. And I'm your co-host, Keelan Harvey. We are your local mortgage experts, bringing in expert advice and inside knowledge on today's events and how it's going to affect your economy. If you're hearing our show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast, but we're here to answer any questions or, more importantly, connect you with the guests that we have on the show today. Please call the show at one 855 1150 Again, that's one 855 400 1150 or online at com. And our lineup for today's show, we have Brenda Martin of John L. Scott, Five Upsides to Downsizing Your Home. We also have in studio Mina Merchant of WorkSo. And we're talking about myths about making a video. Last guest in studio today, Brooke Quist of Seed Intellectual Property Law Group, Strategic Advantages and Pitfalls in Patents and Talking about no bliss there. Great information and great guests in studio. Again, for more information on the topics discussed today, please feel free to call the show at 1-855-411-50. Again, that's 1-855-411-50 or online at themoneyhour.com. And Keelan, what do you think about starting out with a little bit of money chat today? That sounds good to me. All right, let's do it. Money. Money. What do you got for our listeners today, Keelan? Well, I thought it would be uh, a good idea uh, considering this week in the transition. It's kind a of a, new, uh, a great idea. Um, that's We are now with Highlands and whoop, 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 and I'm loving it. You know, we had this fantastic week. We had uh, some of our corporate uh, comrades fly the in. The big corporate. The comrades. big corporate comrades mm-hmm. fly in just for us, and we rented out a space, and they are amazing. They gave us this um, forum where we could just be inundated with everything and just jump in head first to all the information. So I really want to give a big shout out to uh, Christy and Ginger Mm -hmm. and then of course Randy as well and this uh, and Danny and Danny yeah for sure one of the owners Um, of the company yeah just really involved with this transition with us and all the information I couldn't be more excited about everything that we're bringing on and uh, I think the message you know and and we got to go out and kind of go more on a personal level and really get a, a good in-depth conversation and the word that I would say is integrity and uh, integrity has been so important in my business from being a financial uh, planner retirement planning Mm -hmm. you know and just following that integrity and I think what you put out in the world personally or in business comes back to you Uh, why we trust our fearless leader Sean so much is the guy is just integrity 100% he's gonna do what's Mm -hmm. best for us and I got that same message to hear Randy's story and why he transitioned to what he was doing. I think most important to us is going to be always serving our clients. Mm-hmm. And uh, and from the top down, when, when your leaders have a ton of integrity and they care about us, that goes all the way down to the customers. So I left that experience with Highlands just really thankful yeah. and really excited and happy that we have the leaders that we have. We have the support that we have. And our team is already fantastic. Yep. And with the tools that we have, we're going to, I mean, we're just going to elevate even more. We're going to kill it at a higher level. Kill it at an even higher level. Even higher so level. thank you, Danny. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, Ginger. And thank you, Christy. We really appreciate you guys. You guys are fantastic. Yeah. And like Keelan said, I mean, we're always looking for the best place to support our business partners and our clients. And we've got some great stuff coming up from Money Chat in the future. Some of the things that we'll be able to offer to you as our listeners. All right. So today I thought I'd bring in um, talking about buying a home. The cost is more important than the price. So my advice advice is if you're a buyer to look at the cost of purchasing a house more than you're looking at the purchase of the price of the home. 
look at the cost of getting that home. Obviously, price is a part of the equation. Assuming that you're not going to pay all cash, if you're an all cash buyer, a little bit different conversation, but a larger part of the cost is the mortgage interest rate. And the mortgage rate can have a dramatic impact on the overall cost. So we've hit, once again, historical lows on the interest rate. I'm not attempting to predict what the future of the interest rates are going to be, but I wanted to help you understand the potential impact on the cost of purchasing a home if interest rates did increase in the future. Even if you're thinking of buying it in the market and you feel that the market might be dropping, I am not saying that because I don't think our local market is going to drop. If you want to know, if you have a want to make a prediction of what you think the real estate market is going to do, what do you think employment's going to do? Because history shows where real estate always follows employment. And I think I'm safe to say that we're in a really good employment market here in the Seattle market. But let's just say that you thought the market was going to drop. Price, if you believe that interest rates is going to increase, the cost of the home would be more expensive. So let's take a look at some numbers here. Well, you can't look, but you can listen. <laughs> if uh, today you could purchase a home for 500000 with interest rates at three and a quarter, I'm not quoting interest rates today. There's a lot of different qualifying factors, but yes, you can get a three and a quarter percent interest rate today on a 30 year fixed rate mortgage. And if you came with a 5% down payment, that would put your loan amount at 475000 The principal and interest payment would be $2,067. That does not include taxes and insurance. That's just the mortgage, the principal and interest. Now, now, if you waited to purchase thinking the market may decrease, let's just say it went down 5%. $500,000 home would drop down to $475,000. With the same down payment of 5%, your loan amount would be $451,250. But let's say that the interest rate went up a percent to four and a quarter. Your principal and interest payment would be $2219 a month. So for $25,000 discount in price, but with a 1% increase in interest rate, the cost of purchase would be higher to wait, $152 a month higher. Then you calculate that interest, it's gonna have a huge impact. So make sure that you're looking at the true cost of purchase before making a decision to maybe wait in the market. Now, I think that interest rates are going up and I think the market is gonna go up. So it's kind of a double whammy if you're not taking advantage of this market. Now, in any market, there is a shortage of something. You have buyers and you have seller and you have money. We have plenty of buyers out there. We have plenty of money out there. The money meaning the loan programs available, the cost of the interest rate, which we just talked about. Where our shortage is today is in the sellers or the property. Uh, crazy market out there. I don't know about you, Keelan, but every contract that's coming over uh, in the initial stage to update a pre-approval letter to make an offer, every single one of them has multiple offers. And we're going back to waiving finance contingency, um, possibly being willing to pay more for the appraisal if the appraisal comes in low, waiving uh, pre inspection or doing pre-inspection or waiving the home inspection, I would not advise waiving home inspection, but we have an, uh, a realtor that can give advice on that. But doing a pre-inspection, uh, basically paying for that before you know that your offer is going to be accepted, at least then you have the home inspection and, and you know what the quality of the home is going to be. So yeah, I just wanted to bring in, it's really important to uh, look at what it's going to cost you to borrow and take advantage of the market while we're in this uh, great market that we're in here. That's your money chat for today. Coming up next on the Money Hour, five upsides to down sizing your home. Brenda Martin and John L. Scott right here at 1150 AM KKNW after the short break. In today's competitive real estate market, you need a trusted real estate advisor. Brenda Martin's mission statement is to build lifelong relationships while helping to build financial security through home ownership and real estate investment. Hi, this is Brenda Martin with John L. Scott. When you are ready to buy or sell your personal residence or investment property, please give me a call at 425-419-3780 or you can email me at brendam at johnlscott.com. I look forward to hearing from you and helping you navigate our Puget Sound real estate market. Again, give me a call at 425-419-3780. You're listening to The Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell, and co-host, Keelan Harvey, on Alternative Talk AM 1150. Now, back to the show with local mortgage experts, Tina Mitchell and Keelan Harvey. Welcome back to The Money. on 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, February 29th show. I am your host, Tina Mitchell. And I'm your co-host, Keelan Harvey. We are your local mortgage experts. It is a great day to talk about money, and that's what the show is all about, how to make money, 
save money so you can have a better quality of life for you and your family. If you're hearing our show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast. We're here to answer any questions or connect you with the guests that we have on the show. Please call the show at 1-855-411-50. Again, that's 1-855-411-50 or online at themoneyr.com. In studio right now, we have Brenda Martin of John L. Scott, and we're going to be talking about the five upsides to downsizing your home. Brenda, thank you so much for joining us in studio today. Really excited to have you back. Thank you so much for having me. I love listening to you guys, and it's just a great honor to be here. Thank you. You're very welcome. And a little bit about Brenda. Brenda grew up in a family of real estate uh, business and has been surrounded by the industry for her whole life. She holds CNE, Certified Negotiation Expert, and SRES, Senior Real Estate Specialist des designations, and is recognized by John L. Scott as a president's gold agent for her success in helping clients achieve their homeownership goals. Brenda partners with an initiative and a successful team using their combined knowledge to give her clients an advantage for a beneficial real estate expert experience. She is committed to providing professional real estate services with a goal to also exceed expectations. The wonderful friendships that are formed with her and her clients bring Brenda the most satisfaction and joy from working in the residential real estate industry. Brenda, five upsides to downsizing your home. What an important piece in the market to touch on, and I don't think we touch on it enough, so I'm really mm -hmm. excited to hear what you have to say. What would you consider as the biggest upside for most people in the position to downsize their home? Yes, um, it is a, a great topic right now. So many people have a lot of equity, have owned their home a lot for right. a while. Um, number one, I'd say, is enjoy that equity. That's the biggest upside. You've earned it. Mm -hmm. um, when you sell a home you've owned for years, possibly decades, um, chances are you'll have built a quite a bit of uh, equity as you've paid your monthly mortgage month after month. <laughs> I say it's your uh, your home bank account. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, th yeah, there's a good chance whatever smaller home you buy will um, will cost less than the bigger than the bigger one that you're selling. So the possibilities are endless, definitely. So number one, enjoy that equity. So Brenda, let's talk about, there are so many different things that a homeowner can do with that equity. Let's talk about some of those. Yes. Um, oftentimes we hear about bucket list items. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So fun, fun to uh, listen to people's dreams and what's on their bucket list. Uh, we hear about big family trips people have always uh, dreamed of, um, whether it's to, you know, take the whole family somewhere or take a trip to Europe. Um, some people just want to do that ride a horse on the beach thing or do bungee jumping or something like that. Um, the point is to uh, taking something that you've worked so hard for and um, enjoying that equity um, and finally having the freedom to do some of the things you've been wanting to do. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I love that thinking about being able to build some memories with your family. Another thing, you know, maybe look at uh, purchasing a second home. So you've got a vacation place, something you can pass down to your kids. Uh, investment properties are a great opportunity mm -hmm. as well to be able to um, invest in more real estate. Paying off debt is another thing that's really uh, common right now. But you just want to be really careful that when you're paying off revolving debt, that that doesn't mean that you're uh, going out and in going out and getting new debt because I say it's a it's a bank account but you don't want it to be your checking account you want it to be your savings account right yes exactly yeah. yes yes yeah actually my uh, my mom's brother moved to Arizona and there now she's tinkering with the idea of getting buying a property they have a house here and then buying a property in Arizona and going back mm -hmm. and forth mm -hmm. Brenda what are your thoughts on um, buying a vacation home to downsize possibly well, yeah, that's actually um, definitely on a lot of people's bucket list. You know, it's mm -hmm. um, they want to have a, a, a second home, possibly in a warmer climate, a place where their family will come and gather, um, build some more memories again, whether, you know, usually it's a warmer climate, but every once in a while somebody will say, I want that cabin in the woods or I want that condo at the beach. Um, and it's just all about, again, savings, not yes. a, it's building assets, but also assets that have purpose and building uh, those family relationships is a big one. You know, and the second layer they're thinking about is uh, vacation renteling. I mean, mm -hmm. renteling, mm -hmm. is that even a word? I mean, <laughs> just made that it's up. It's a Keelan just, word. It's, it's all Keelan good. We'll ever, Victoria is keeping track of all been, the uh, Keelan words. You've been way. renteling? It's great. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it, they have some income on both sides when they're not there and they can travel back and forth, which exactly. is also a smart idea to subsidize your retirement. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. That is a great, great upside too, also. Yeah. 
So, Brenda, let's talk about uh, considering downsizing. And, you know, when you're downsizing, you have to get a lot a rid, of, rid of a lot of things, a lot of stuff that you have. And so what advice do you have for people that just have a lot of things that they've collected over the years that they need to get rid of. Yes, yes. Well, this is the toughest part. We all gather so many precious and personal treasures. Mm. Um, I personally have a tough time with this. I lost both my parents early on, so any little uh, thing of theirs is kind of precious. But I also know that my kids don't necessarily want my stuff. (laughs) You know, that that is precious to me. Um, So my best advice is to go through all of our things and make a move to downsize downsize while it's on our terms. Um, we, we hear stories of people feeling forced or having to no control because of health issues arise. Um, so my best advice is to do it, you know, when, when that comes to you and on your terms that way. So, yeah, but it is tough. Brenda, I, we watched this movie called Minimalists on Netflix. And ever since then, I purged. And I'm convinced that stuff is stress now because mm-hmm. when you, I get rid of a bunch of stuff, First part is I don't even realize I got rid of a bunch of it, which is weird. And secondly, it's just less to manage. And so you just feel freer. Like, you you know, there's a stress factor that's lift off of me, I feel like. And I continue to collect stuff, but I just got to get rid of it. That's the point. Yeah, so you just have a set amount of uh, space that you have. And when that space is full, you don't have any more. So you have to either get rid of something or not purchase anything new. Yeah, that T-shirt, I haven't worn it in three years. Why is it in my closet? I don't understand. (laughs) Got to get rid of those. So um, what kind of benefits do you hear, Brenda, from... uh, your clients about a smaller place with less stuff well uh, number two (laughs) of the of the the upside of downsizing (laughs) definitely definitely is having newfound time on your hands Um, owning a small smaller home typically means um, less time maintenance and dusting and weeding and mowing and that sort of thing Um, it reminds me of my mom we always had a good sized home but I remember her speaking about not wanting knickknacks to dust and Um, whereas we always had a clean home, it's not like it was her choice of use of her time. So, Mm -hmm. um, I know, I know there's a lot of hobbies she would like to have gotten to. And I think definitely an upside is more time on your hands and it goes back to, um, again, having less stuff creates more time and less stress for your life. Yeah. Love it. Let's talk about little surprises that you might have when you're downsizing Brenda. I think, okay, so that brings us to number three. I know we're working on five of list of five, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> we're Thanks there. for numbering yeah. those out. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so definitely number three, I think of an upside is a chance to make a fresh start. Downsizing is a perfect time to make a fresh start, embrace opportunities, possibly to live in a big city, maybe if, if you're not currently living in one and get rid of that, um, you know, commute maybe. It's um, whether you're wished for a warmer climate or wanted to make, move to an area that allows you more uh, time to devote to a hobby like fishing or sailing possibly. It's just another time again to um, embrace a fresh start. I I have some clients right now, we just sold their house and they are moving to Montana. They're fly fishing, they're so excited um, just for that, being in that peaceful beauty in the mountains. And um, so yeah, number three, a fresh start. That's a a big surprise. People realize, wow, I can can do, make this fresh start. It's a perfect time to, do something I've wanted to do. So it's beautiful. You worked your whole life. Why not do yes. what you actually want to do? Like, and I mean, for me, I think it's going to be like when I turn 21, you know, it's like, oh, the bars, this is great. I'm a new yeah. man, <laughs> you know, and, and I'm an adult now. But when you retire, I mean, now is your time to fulfill your dreams. Mm-hmm. Like, enjoy that. You worked your whole life for that. When I was doing retirement planning, that was kind of my part of the passion of that is helping people to prepare to make that transition and preparation for those listeners is very important. Make mm-hmm. sure that you're putting your pennies aside and really planning for that day so you can enjoy that moment in your life because people are living a lot longer than they used to. So, right. Um, what about what are your thoughts, Brenda, on um, aging in place? What are the benefits of following that path? Um, People often ask, does it make sense to just stay put? And there's no doubt about it that uh, there's definitely comfort in staying um, in a home you've lived in your whole life. Um, There's the familiarity, can say that, (laughs) (laughs) Um, of your current home. um, That's a a big pro of aging in place. But then the potential financial drawbacks of remodeling or renovating so that you're able to stay, uh, you know, are some cons as well. So... um, there that you know that's something people have to to weigh you know the the benefits of um the familiarity of staying in your home versus 
um, the expense of remodeling and, and, you know, you have to also consider um, maintenance of your home, planning for that, and also taking care of yourself while you're staying in your home. So just, yeah, that's a... Love it. Yeah. So Brenda, let's talk about where um, I've just gone through this recently with my husband's uh, mom and trying to determine what to do. Of course, she wanted to stay in her home. Mm -hmm. uh, we looked at the option of, of her possibly moving with us. Uh, with us. Now that that thought process didn't go for too long. We actually ended up moving her a really nice senior community. But um, what do you have that you see with how many of your clients that are downsizing that they're actually doing multi-generation where parents might be moving in with their kids? and? Yes. So I'm actually hearing this more and more lately, and it does my heart good, definitely, that mm -hmm. there's options for parents that way, that um, people are open to that. Um, according to the National Association of Realtors, their, their uh, 2018 profile of home buyers and sellers, um, it said 12% of all buyers have a multi-generational household. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, there's the benefits of shared expenses and shared responsibilities. And then there's also... Um, special occasions, they have the luxury of seeing each other every day also. So it is something people bring up and it's kind of a growing trend for sure. Yeah, and our, our uh, development in our uh, house, we actually have two houses that have two master bedrooms and each have three generations living in those houses. Oh, awesome. Yeah, so yeah. it's wow. they're building houses to support multi-generation. I think that's great. Yeah. I joke with my family, I'm gonna buy land and build a compound and just stuff them all in this land on this property yeah. and have like a community center. There you go. And then I'll hire, get more people there and they'll just think they have friends and then I'll actually make a bunch of money as a retirement <laughs> center. Uh, we had a huge, yeah, running joke about that, but um, I love I'm not awesome, serious. I, I love my family. I'm yeah, just, your parents are Aww. great. Um, so what would you say, Brenda, if someone is considering downsizing, where do they start in this whole process? Uh, um, again, it comes back to having choices and making any changes on your own terms. When considering downsizing, the best place to start is with your close family and friends. Um, always, you know, people that care about you are your best resource, of course, talking about your concerns uh, with the process and uh, any fears about any change. Um, you know, also talk about the upside and the good stuff, too. There's uh, lots of good stuff, and hopefully uh, this helped people think of, of the good part of downsizing also. Absolutely. Brenda, as we're wrapping up our, our time here, uh, why do you do what you do? Why are you in the real estate uh, industry? What's your why behind it? You know, I love the people part of this uh, business. Mm -hmm. uh, definitely, it's about each each person, each home. It's all a different story, every person that I help. Um, and I've gathered so many close friends from working in this business for sure. So yeah. definitely what I love about it. Wonderful. Well, Brenda, thank you so much for joining us in studio. It was a pleasure to have a conversation with you around real estate and downsizing. Thank you so much. Coming up next on The Money Hour, Miss About Making a Video, Mina Merchant of WorkSo, right here at 1150 AM KKNW after this short break. Are you a small to medium-sized business that's in need of creative video content? Do you need internal and external facing videos that showcase your products, your philosophy, or your brand? WorkSo is a Pacific Northwest-based video production company owned and operated by Mina Merchant and Mitch Shepard, a husband and wife dynamic duo who specialize in honing in on your unique story and translating that into a video that is eye-catching and memorable. Even better than that, WorkSo makes video fun. They also prioritize the promoting and hiring of women and people of color for all of their projects. If you're ready to take your video quality to the next level, contact WorkSo for a free consultation. Take note, the first question they'll ask you is why do you need a video? They are committed to making sure your marketing dollars are well spent and that you see a return on that investment. So if you are ready to create something original, creative, fun, and fair, get in touch with WorkSo today. Visit WorkSo.com and fill out the Contact Us page and get started. WorkSo, you need a video. Hi, this is Mina from WorkSo. If you'd like to get started, I invite you to visit our website to connect with us. You're listening to The Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell, and co-host, Keelan Harvey on Alternative Talk AM 1150. Now, back to the show with local mortgage experts, Tina Mitchell and Keelan Harvey. 
Welcome back to The Money on 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, February 29th show. I am your host, Tina Mitchell. And I am your co-host, Keelan Harvey. You're a local mortgage co- <laughs> You're over. I just messed up because you're over there cracking up. Yeah, I just stumbled over. We're just laughing at myself. It's all okay. good. I like well, we're, it. Your, we're your local mortgage experts, and we'd like to have fun here in studio. We're here to help you build a strong financial blueprint one week and one time, one show at a time. Now you got me going, <laughs> Keelan. If you're hearing my show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast, but we're here to answer any questions or connect you with the guests that we have on the show today. Please feel free to call the show at 1-855-411-50. Again, that's 1-855-411-50 or online at themoneyhour.com. In studio right now, we have Mina Merchant of Works and we're talking about myths about making a video. First time in studio, Mina. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. And a little bit about Mina. Mina is the CEO of WorkSo. As its leader, she guides the company as it traverses the landscape of corporate, nonprofit sector, and more artistic storytelling. Prior to this, she was a owner of a graphic design company and a stationery company. She worked for many years as a graphic designer, product designer, and as a marketing extraordinaire. She has also spent a lot of time creating teaching and promoting the creation of art in her home, at her son's school, and in her community. Mina has lived in California, New York City, and the greater Seattle area. Mina seeks connections through the cultivation of relationships. Her heart's calling is to give airtime and use film and video as a medium to tell the stories of women and people of color among other minorities. Mina, I love that. I can't tell you how many experts we've had in here all over the all over the board. I mean, you name it as far as how important it is for like real estate agents, mortgage people, professionals, anybody that's trying to get their word out, how a video is so important nowadays. So I'm so excited to talk with you about this. This is what you do. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, what some of the aspects to creating a video that people just don't know? So I think, um, you know, in today's age of YouTube and our iPhones, you know, it's super easy to pick up your phone and make a video. Mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people don't realize what really goes into it. And of course, you can certainly make a video run and gun like that, not really thinking about it. But the true craft and what we specialize in is helping you to think through. And the majority of our time and effort goes into something we call pre-production, which is taking time to get to know you. You know, asking you why you want a video, figuring out who you're, what you're really about, what you're trying to say, why you're trying to say it, and maximizing this visual medium because there's so many different ways to communicate. And one wonderful way is through video. And it's so visually based. But yes. ironically, a lot of people want to make videos that are just about a person talking, Yeah, <laughs> which, you know, we could do like right now on the radio. Uh, why do you need to see that? So... We really try to push the envelope a little bit and get people to think outside of what they would normally think of as, hey, let's create, let's make something beautiful and compelling and uh, get your message across that way. So, yeah, so, so important. And, you know, you're being a disservice to your clients if you're not presenting yourself in the best possible fashion for them to be able to connect with you. And video is the way to do that. So, I mean, let's talk about why it's important uh, for you to be in a leader leadership position with your company. Yeah, that question is a good one for me because I've avoided it for a long time. And what I realize is that, you know, I've spent a lifetime working for other people, supporting them, doing everything behind the scenes. And now in this current role, I've had this great honor of stepping out from behind that mm -hmm. curtain and being at the forefront and setting an example, being a role model for any other young women or people of color, or other voices that maybe don't get heard to be in a leadership role to guide how things are communicated and seen out in the world and i think that's really really important i mm -hmm. i missed a lot of that growing up i wish i had more of that and now it's a pleasure to be able to fill that role as best as i can yeah that's so well said um and the question always comes you have a fantastic service that you offer it happens to the best of us that offer fantastic service what does it cost? That to do is a the video? million dollar question. <laughs> that is a million dollar question. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what does it cost? So, uh, you know, I've heard a million different analogies, but I'll give you one that was really uh, very pertinent to us last year. We had to have a remodel. It was a forced remodel due to a leak 
that one of our pipes burst in the wall. Uh-huh. We didn't find oh. it for months. Oh my golly! And you know, the in, according to the insurance uh, agent, the claims adjuster, they said, "Well, this repair is going to cost twelve thousand dollars." And in Ouch. the end, I think we spent forty thousand dollars. Oh and my! And so golly. it was expensive. Yeah. So the the point is that you know things can. Co- there's a big spectrum. You yes. pick up your iPhone, you shoot a video that way with no pre planning or anything. It's not going to cost much, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've done projects that range from anywhere from like $2,000 up to $100,000, $150,000 or so. And it really just depends. And how do you use those resources and why do you allot those resources in the ways that you do? So we like to work with our clients to figure out, okay, listen, you have $10,000, you have $5,000. Let's see what we're trying to do and who we need to make that project happen. So it really varies. And that is the hardest question for us to answer without doing some level of education with our clients. Well, I like to say you get what you pay for, right? <laughs> I mean, that's the truth of it. You that can is. find something really, really cheap, but chances are it's it's not going to work out very well for you. Even clothes, things like that. You can find a, che- a T-shirt for five bucks, but you probably have a hole in it in two months, and now you're getting another T-shirt. So, like, you get what you pay for, and, you know, and the value of that is going to be direct reflection of that. So remember that, people. You go out there and you just mm-hmm. buy things. Just because it's cheap, it doesn't mean it's the best financial decision for you, especially in real estate. That's true. Very yeah. True. So, Mina, where are you located and where do you conduct business at? So, we are located in Renton, Washington, just a little south of Seattle. And we have the great pleasure of working uh, on site at our residence. So, we have a pretty big piece of property and a separate freestanding building where we have our studio. Uh, we do conduct a lot of business there, and we also do a lot of business where we need to go shoot. So uh-huh. that's all over the state. It's all over the country and in other countries when necessary. Well, Mina, you are uh, clearly stylish. You look like you'd be fun to hang out with. So I'm curious. <laughs> I'm curious. Um, Absolutely. What does your work-life balance, what does that mean to you? So work-life balance to me is really about making your work fit around your life. And uh, my husband and I have had many a conversation about what is the life that we really want to live? You know, what's that quality of life that we're really looking for? And how can we mold our work around that or to support that? Mm -hmm. And so for us, it's being able to be on site at our home so that our older son can be homeschooled. For us, it's also about having real flexibility so we can go attend events for our kids or family members or other friends that we want to support in the community. Um, And so we don't work nine to five strict hours, sometimes working on the weekends, sometimes at night, you know, whatever it works for us. We also are really fundamentally creative people. So some for me, it's the morning hours. My husband, it's the late night. So we kind of just do things the way we like to and the less structure, the better. Yeah, and I'm like your husband. I I love I call it my on time. It's when I'm creating and developing new ideas into my business and I get so involved and so excited about it. I'll just literally sometimes stay up for, you know, for nights with very little sleep. So I get all my energy uh, late at night. But and yeah, the balance is important. And I I love what you said, uh, you know, Mina is each for each of us balance is going to be different. Sometimes you're going to be more in a grind in your business. Sometimes you're going to be spending more time with your family. But when you can create a business model, which you just explained, uh, and I uh, do with my business as well, is everything is mixed in with your business and not. You know, so I travel with my business partners. I I do my my things that are important to me to me through my retreats and my coaching, and so everything that I'm passionate about it's tied with my business. And so it's kind of living both of those at the same time, which is you know kind of what you were sharing as well. So let's talk, Nina. um, Tell us a little bit about a recent video project that you did and talk about some of the successes and challenges that you experienced through that project. So, yeah, I'm not going to name any specific names here just to, you know, to protect privacy. But of course, um, we've had a couple of clients recently with very limited budgets, you know, big aspirations, you know, big ask about what they're trying to get done with the limited uh, resources. And so we love to be really creative. I think parameters are great. You know, it gives you something to bounce against, bounce up against. Uh-huh. So it's not that we can't do that. Here's the challenge. The challenge I have is getting the client to sort of get out of their own way. Yeah. There's a there people tend sometimes people have difficulty trusting us, you know, just mm. to do what we do best. And the thing that really I think is a great skill of ours is to 
be creative, like super creative, come up with a unique idea that not everybody might think of that will really set your business or organization apart. So we get stuck in a lot of internal bureaucracy. (laughs) We get stuck (laughs) in a lot of, we had a team we were working with recently, a uh, medical company where they have probably five or six people working on one idea and they tried to have us on earlier this year instead of just the last minute. So they Uh thought, let's get them in six months early. We've literally spent the six months kind of going back and forth. Nobody can decide. It's a lot of wishy-washy. So I think... (laughs) Sometimes Somebody needs to be in not. charge of this. They need Somebody. to let you be in charge. <laughs> right. And so now we're down to the wire. We have about three weeks to do the video, and we've just settled on an idea that is not at all what they've been talking yeah. about for the last several months. So that's oh the that sometimes can be challenging. Now, on the other hand, when people just let you do your thing, yeah. they don't realize that actually the, the process of making a video can be really fun, mm-hmm. and it allows for things that are unpredictable to happen. And so when they just come in, you know, come and sit down with us, let us film them it's really exciting and they get excited too because they're like wow this sounds really good you know they can start to see what what's taking shape yeah let let the expert do their job let them pull the magic out and that's right. what you do in creativity and video making exactly like say too many chiefs and not enough indians it never works out well <laughs> mm-hmm. not very, uh, not a very pc example <laughs> no <laughs> i didn't mean that in any derogatory way i guess <laughs> um what are you currently working on mina So we are currently working on a few different projects. One is for a local produce market. It's based in Renton, Washington, family owned, wonderful, just stronghold of the community. And we're working on a series of ads for them to just promote their business, get the word out. They they use so many local vendors and suppliers, artisanal products, like just excellent quality of stuff. And they're so passionate about what they do. And I'm Mm -hmm. so excited to get that word out there in a way that's really unique. That's awesome. So let's talk about your ideal client, Mina. Who would that be? What is that? Who do they look like? So the, our ideal client, you know, comes in all shapes and sizes. We just love to be able to get into either an organization, an art individual person, business person, small, large company, but somebody that is interested in just thinking outside of the box and letting us get in there, get to know them a little bit. Somebody who's really in, wants to be engaged with us in our process. One of the toughest things is to have a client that is just doesn't have any interest in talking to you. They want you to do the job, but they don't actually want to do anything with you. (laughs) So and we really see that as a relationship. So it's a client that's interested in having that relationship with us. And to get the value, you got to know your client, right? Exactly. And get the Mm -hmm. feedback of what they want to kind of present out there. So uh, what about passion projects? What do you got going for passion projects these days? So I'm actually working on a documentary right now about a dear, dear friend who is a classical Indian dancer. And I have been spending, I've been working on it for about a year and a half. And I think I'm maybe 30, 40% into the process. So it's definitely a long haul Uh um, just to tell her story and show a bit about what it's like to be a woman, uh, you know, born in America, but from immigrant parents and pursuing her art form full time. So I think that that's really, it can be so inspirational to others. Yeah. And it's always fun to have a great passion project. So excited to see that one has been completed. We've got about a minute left. And so in a short version, what is the process of making a video, Mina? The process, I would say, is, you know, you engage us, just reach out. Uh, we sit down with you, get to know you a little bit and see what are your parameters? Like, what's what are you trying to do? Why yeah. do you think you need a video? And we're going to ask you a bunch of questions. So we'll ask you to think and think through the process with us. Mm. Um, and we will help you to figure out some concepts, some brainstorms. We love to do that. And then figure out just how to stay within your parameters of the project and get across the message that you're really trying to get across. So there's pre-production, then there's production. So how do we shoot it? Where do we shoot it? Yeah. How long is that going to take? And then there's post-production. So that's when we got everything in the can, but we're editing it down to that beautiful sweet spot that we're going for. And then we deliver. Love that, Mina. Well, if you're listening to the show, uh, no matter what industry you're in, you need to get on video to be able to sh- not not just share your product, but more important, to share your story. And I think that's what a good uh, videographer company uh, can do, uh, like Mina's company. So, Mina, thank you so much for coming in and joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It was real fun. For more information or to connect with Mina, you can call the show at 1-855-411-50. Again, that's 1-855-411-50 or online at themoneyr.com. 
Coming up next on The Money, our strategic advantages and pitfalls in patents. Burt Quist of Seed Intellectual Property Law Group right here at 1150 AM, KKNW, after this short break. Every 19 minutes, another baby is born addicted to drugs due to a dramatic increase in opioid use. Referrals to CPS are increasing, as are mental health issues in children. And teen suicide is now at a 30-year high. And for thousands of children and families, things are getting worse. Childhood trauma and adversity are a national epidemic that impact all of us financially and morally, directly and indirectly. They're the root cause of the most urgent and costly problems that plague our communities, proven to increase poor school performance, incarceration, diabetes, suicide, heart disease, stroke, and cancer. That's five of the top ten leading causes of death. Why aren't we doing more about it? Fortunately, Child Haven is. Child Haven is a 110-year-old organization that's preventing childhood trauma and adversity and helping heal children and families when it does occur. How are we doing this? Through a wraparound continuum of care tied together by relational health, the best predictor of lifelong well-being. But Child Haven can't do it alone. We must infuse relational health everywhere children live, learn, and play. If you're ready to address the root causes instead of applying Band-Aid fixes, we invite you to join us on this crusade. Visit childhaven.org or call 206-957-4806. That's childhaven.org. You're listening to The Money Hour with your host, Tina Mitchell, and co-host, Keelan Harvey, on Alternative Talk AM 1150. Now, back to the show with local mortgage experts, Tina Mitchell and Keelan Harvey. Welcome back to The Money Hour at 1150 AM KKNW, the Saturday, February 29th show. I am your host, Tina Mitchell. And I'm your co-host, Keelan Harvey. We are your local mortgage experts, bringing in studio each week the best of the best experts in all areas regarding your finances. We are here to help you build a strong financial blueprint one week and one show at a time. If you're hearing our show at a different time or day, you are listening to a rebroadcast, but we're here to connect you with the guest. Uh, please call the show at one 855 1150 or online at themoneyhour.com. Again, that's one 855 1150 or online at themoneyhour.com. In studio right now, first time for our guest, we have Brooke Quist of Seed Intellectual Property Law Group, Strategic Advantages and Pitfalls in patents. Ignorance is not bliss. Brooke, thank you so much for joining us today. So excited to have a conversation with you. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. And a little bit about Brooke. Brooke is a partner at Seed Intellectual Property Law Firm, LLP, with over 22 years of experience in intellectual property law. Prior to joining joining Seed IP, Brooke was a partner at uh, Steptoe and Johnson LLP. Before practicing law, Mr. Quist was a senior research and design engineer in the aircraft division of Northwest Corporation. Brooke specializes in domestic and foreign intellectual property, including strategic portfolio development, patent preparation, and prosecution. Freedom to operate opinions, patent invalidity, and non infringent opinions, due diligent investigations, client counseling, licensing, and technology transfer agreements. Brooke lectures on U.S. patent practices at the University of Washington's renowned Center for Advanced Study and Research on Innovation. And I know, Brooke, that you actually just earlier this week, you did a, um, a really big uh, speaking engagement. How'd that go? It went, went well. I've been speaking yeah. quite a bit recently. I spoke at the, the WISPLA event, which is a Washington State Intellectual Property Association, mm-hmm. and then also uh, yesterday was at the Washington State Bar Association for our uh, 24th annual IP Institute. We had lots of great speakers there, including the director of the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office came well, and gave a great speech as well. That is awesome. Yeah. I know you do a lot of educating around uh, patent, and that's why we have you here in studio. So, so excited to have you. Super. Happy to be here. <laughs> Brooke, how, that's really cool. Um, I'm a big fan of Shark Tank, and that's my exposure to patents, where they talk about that all the time. Do you got a patent? Yeah. Is a utility patent, 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 patent? And I was like, wow, that's kind of important if you think about it. Um, why should you, uh, for our listeners out there, care about your patent? Yeah, it's interesting you bring up Shark Tank because that, that's most people's exposure to patent laws. <laughs> yeah, right. And, uh, and so it's a, it's a good takeoff from there is, you know, why do they always ask, do you have any patents? 
And the reason is they want to know, do you have a competitive advantage in the marketplace? Mm -hmm. Is there anything that's going to be a barrier to your uh, potential competitors coming in and trying to do the same thing you're doing? Because there's always going to be someone who's uh, bigger or, you know, can do things cheaper because, you know, of where they're located or so forth. And so if you have some way to protect what you're doing, that's going to give you an advantage and it's going to make uh, someone like those in Shark Tank who are investors know that it's a good investment. Uh, when I was speaking yesterday at the Washington State Bar Association, I was uh, moderating one panel and we had an investment banker there and they said that uh, of every single company that they currently had on their, port on their portfolio, they all had an IP strategy. They all either had their own patents or were licensing patents or wow. had some way that they were protecting what they're doing. Now, that's not always going to be true. These guys were particularly focused, but it just really shows that, that that's going to give you an advantage. And that's not the only way it can be done. You can also, uh, some companies will, will license, they're not actually doing what the patents do, but they're licensing their patents out to others. Mm. Uh, and that can be a way that someone small can compete in a big space. I had uh, one client who was, uh, who was you know, a, a stay-at-home mom, and she uh, had a, an invention that was a, a pet-related device, and mm -hmm. she was never going to be able to compete with all the, the you know, the big dogs in that market, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, but we were able to get a license agreement with her for one of the big companies, and then she could have that money kind of roll on in from that, from that investment. And also, that's a way that someone small can, uh, can keep from being protected against someone big, is if you license to one of the big guys, then they can fight off the other big guy instead of you having to do that. Yeah, and we hear about that on uh, Shark Tank, too, yeah, the licensing. Kevin O'Leary, what, what's going to stop me from taking your idea and squashing you like a bug? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's, got endless, he's, got, he's Daddy Warbucks. He's yeah. got endless, yeah. endless pockets, so... Yeah, uh, those are valid questions. You, <laughs> yeah, want, you right. want to make sure you ask those. <laughs> yeah. So, Brooke, what are some other real benefits of having uh, patents? So, uh, one thing that uh, uh, they sometimes don't get into it in as much detail in Shark Tank, but if uh, if you were following up on their after conversations, you probably would, was not just do you have patents, but are your patents really on what your technology is or, or whatever it is that you're selling? What's your mm -hmm. business model? Where are you making your money, and is that where your patents are located? Are they are they really strategic, right on your business development strategy? Because lots of people will file patents with the best of intentions, and then you know the, the direction of the company tilts a little bit. They go in a different direction, and they they wind up with a bunch of patents that uh, that really aren't that valuable because mm -hmm. they're not on what they're really doing. So, for example, I had one client that uh, recently went through an acquisition from a multi-billion-dollar company, and. As we were going through the due diligence, you know, one of the things that the company who was acquiring them wanted to know was, you know, can match up your patents with your product. Mm -hmm. Show me where uh, where the patents and where these claims match up with what you're actually doing, with what you're selling, with how it. And if you have that, that's great. That's powerful. If you don't have that, then it's nice, and you know, it can those patents can give, you know, some uh, some good feelings, some goodwill, some confidence to your uh, to your uh, your engineers or other technical people, and that might be great, but it's not near as powerful as if they're really protecting your product. Another thing to look at, sorry to keep no, going go right here, but ahead. another thing to look at is, are you really at a choke point in the marketplace? Mm. Are you, with the, what you're protecting with your patent, is that the only way to do something? Because if it is, that's going to be a lot more powerful. If you are doing something and you get a patent on it, let's say a way to encrypt a file. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's 20 different ways to do that, maybe even more. So, just because you've protected your way that you're doing it, your competitors can do something that's equivalent, that's different than what you're doing, but achieves the same effect. So that patent isn't going to be near as powerful. But if sense. you've got a, the only way that something can be done, that's something that's really going to give you a big advantage. So, Brooke, would you say kind of like an estate plan and your financial plan and your taxes? I mean, you're looking at these things on an annual basis. Is that important when you have a patent as well, that you're having it reviewed by your attorney to make sure that any changes that are happening, that you're kind of, you know, looking at that? Or is that not necessary? Uh, yeah. So it's a little bit different than that. But okay. let's let's start out and explain that the patent prosecution, the, the process during which you get the patent is a several year period. So the patent office likes to, likes to say on average it's three years. Uh -huh. So let's just go with that for sake of argument. Uh, and it may be, uh, I think they like to estimate 14 months before you get your first official review of that patent. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then 
usually that that first official review they tell you that you can't have the patent for one or more reasons and mm -hmm. and actually that you kind of want to get that if you get a first action mm -hmm. allowance it's kind of like if you get a new job and you ask for a salary and they go yes right away you're like oh yeah. i didn't ask for enough did i yes <laughs> <laughs> so so usually not always but usually you you're trying to ask for enough that the first thing you get is a refusal and then you go back and and you explain to them why you're different than what's out there and why you should get that patent and and then you go through that back and forth process Got so it. during that during that you know year or two or three you should be in contact you your patent attorney and and the client the company or the engineers or whoever is taking uh, charge of that reign should be in contact and, and letting your patent attorney know how your product has developed in that period of time. Okay. Yeah, of course. So, yeah. So yeah. that when you're, when you have those opportunities to amend your claim section, as you go through the patent prosecution process, that you can keep it on focus or, or you know, you might find that, you know, if, uh, you know, un unfortunately that product didn't make it, you know, yes. the, the company went another, another direction. And then, you, so you may not want to pursue that. Um, or you may want to get the patent and see if there's an opportunity to license it or sell it to someone else. But by keeping abreast of what's happening during that course, you can make sure that you keep it on focus. Yeah. Um, a another thing to account for is maybe um, maybe your product that you're making in-house is different or, or stopped, but your competitor is doing something. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure that you try and get something that's going to cover your competitors, uh, assuming that you've got support for that in your patent, so that you've got an advantage in the marketplace. Got it. That's, you know, that's really interesting. I noticed on Shark Tank, you have somebody that comes in with a product, and then they'll mention their patent, and then all of a sudden the sharks light up, like, oh, wait a second, because it's all about how your patent is written and designed. And some of these business owners that are pitching it have no idea on how valuable just their patent is. Their product is worthless, but this patent and the way it's verbalized um, is priceless. So they get all excited about that and show a completely different angle. Mm. In your opinion, Brooke, um, what makes a patent more valuable than the next? Well, like we were saying there, partially it's about uh, does your patent cover actual technology that's you, either you're using or other people want to use. Mm -hmm. So if you have a patent and it's, it's on technology that's either not being utilized by you or by someone else, that's going to be less valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, the easiest way uh, to to give a, put a valuation to pr put a price on something is if there's an actual marketplace for it. So if you can say, oh, I'm selling these products and I can attribute these sales directly to my patent because mm -hmm. uh, I'm selling and my competitor's not, and the reason I'm selling is because I've got a patented feature. That's the easiest way to do it. it makes sense. But there's other times when um, when someone like the sharks you talk about or mm -hmm. the investment banker I had on the panel yesterday yeah. will say, oh, that person has. Uh, patents and they don't realize how valuable they are. Mm -hmm. So they will sometimes, when that company goes under or it needs financial, you know, it's in financial distress, they'll have an opportunity to buy those up and then apply them to an area that that, that they know has potential value. Wow, that's sneaky. That is really, that's really <laughs> sneaky. So, uh, Brooke, what about dangers? The biggest danger when it comes to patent law? Yeah. So the biggest dangers that uh, a lot of small businesses uh, and and uh, ind independent inventors don't know is that you can actually bar yourself from getting a patent if you don't act quick enough. Mm. Now, with other types of intellectual property like trademarks and copyrights, you can uh, you can have your copyrighted material like your website or your book or whatever out for years, decades, and then protect it. Then go and okay. file for protection. Same with your trademark. With like your, my coaching program, I had five you know five years before yeah. I did mine. Yeah, because yeah. because you get common law protection and it actually gets stronger during that period. Mm -hmm. But with patents. When you disclose your idea or you sell it or you offer it for sale, that starts a one-year clock ticking. And at the end of wow. that year, you bar yourself from getting a patent on your own technology. Oh, my God. So, so never. You've, you're just done. No, well, yeah, at least on that version. We have had okay. cases where, where clients have come in and they haven't known that. And we say, well, you know, 1.0 is gone, but what about 2.0? Okay, mm -hmm. so you're, there's you're some still, ways around that. You're still inventing, that. right? Yeah. go, oh, yeah, we're still inventing. Yeah. So we can come in and if if the changes that they're making are significant enough that mm. they're patentable on their own, then we can come in and help later on. But it's much better in the beginning. And that's why we always try and encourage people, even if you don't know if you have something that's patentable, you know, come to me or someone, other repu reputable patent attorney will usually, you know, give you a, a free consultation and say, hey, do I have something here that, 
that you know I need to worry about that I should try and protect. So let's say you just have this new this new idea or this new concept or invention. Mm-hmm. What, the first thing that people u- usually want to do is talk about it. They want to tell yeah. you know an advisor or they want to tell a potential investor. So how how can they protect themselves? So the two main ways people can do that is either by uh, using a non disclosure agreement or by using a, what's called a provisional patent. Mm. Pro, uh, both of them have limitations, but but they both are far better than nothing. The problems with non-disclosure agreements is that a lot of investors and, and venture capital people just won't sign them. Um, mm. There can also be some issues as to, you know, what's your recourse if someone violates it. Uh, you only have a, a contract recourse. You don't have patent recourse. And then with, with a provisional application, that gives you uh, a one-year placeholder during which to go back and, and uh, file a real patent on that. So you can file those usually pretty quickly and, uh, you know, at a fraction of the cost of an actual patent. And then you can have some protection to go and talk to whoever you want to talk about and know that you're not going to be shooting yourself in the foot. Some dangers there, though, is you're only protecting what you actually file on. Mm-hmm. So if you file a real short provisional and then go and talk beyond what's covered in there, everything beyond what was covered is, is fair, f- game. fair game for you to yeah. be shooting yourself in the foot again. <laughs> oh, bummer. Wow. Well, Brooke, thank you so much. I wish we had more time with you. You're just, you have so much information uh, around this and I just really appreciate you coming in and sharing with our listeners. It was a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Happy back. Sounds good. And this is your host, Tina Mitchell. And your co-host, Keelan Harvey. Signing off for the day. Thanks for joining us this weekend. We'll be back same time, same place next Saturday, right here at 1150 AM KKNW. Tina Mitchell, MLO 145420, and Keelan Harvey, MLO 133075, are licensed loan originators with Highlands Residential Mortgage Limited, NMLS 134871. The views expressed by the speakers on the preceding program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of Highlands Residential Mortgage Limited, nor are they necessarily endorsed by Highlands Residential Mortgage Limited.